Bible study here at Faith of Victory Church. Hallelujah. I hope you're having a chocolate milk kind of day in your life. Hallelujah. You know, this that's, makes life really good. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm just being silly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And um, we're so happy to have you with us. And we haven't done this since, I haven't done this so I forgot to unplug everything so that we aren't getting blowback here. And uh, we're going to share and say, hey, everybody, glory, 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 glory to God. Well, we're glad to have you tonight. Praise God. Um, it has been some time since I've been with you. Um, those who maybe only join us on Wednesday nights, my, my lovely wife and I uh, celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary in July. And uh, this summer, we also celebrated 40 years of ministry. So we took a sabbatical. Hallelujah. Are we on? Okay. We've got issues with the audio. Looks like we've got issues with the video, too. Testing one, too. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, Y'all can comment out there last night if, if you're seeing something or if it's coming through. I am looks like there's something wrong. Praise the Lord. We uh, hoping that everything works out here real quick. We're just having some, some technical issues. Testing. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Did we get... Are we overdriving? Well, that's not on my side here. All right, how's that better? Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hi, everybody that's out there. Uh, let us know who's out there with us right now. So we, we, are, we apologize. We really don't know what's happening. Glory. Hallelujah. And... Hallelujah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, hallelujah. Like I said, it's a chocolatey type Wednesday night. Did we find out? All right. I still don't see audio or video. I still don't see video up here. Oh, she was focused on the audio. Okay. Like I said, it's been a it's been a few weeks since we did it. Dr. Bill's been doing this for his own home studio. And um apparently we uh just had a brain cramp. Hallelujah. All righty, all right. Let's let's kind of start this over. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Faith and Victory Church. Glad to be back with you. And uh, glory to God, trust you've been doing well this summer. Praise the Lord. Um, we're going to share tonight on the uh, church. And um, just a word to encourage us to walk in um, the higher places in, in the kingdom of God. Amen. Um, you know, the Bible, when we see the church in the book of Acts, how it was birthed. And how God brought the church into fruition, um, it was brought and birthed uh, in power, in, in supernatural manifestations, uh, with the demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the church of Acts was a church that flowed in the supernatural, preached the word, amen, 
you know, go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. So, you know, uh, the, the preaching of the word was the um, prerequisite to the demonstrations of the spirit, as it were. Um, you know, but throughout the book of Acts, they went and preached. They preached the word of God. There were demonstrations of the spirit. Power of God was in manifestation. And um, the church was birthed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So if it was born in the supernatural and born in the power of God, in order to sustain it, it must be carried on the same way. Hallelujah. You know, you can't um, start a restaurant serving really good food and then get it to a certain point and change all that to sorry food. Um, you know, if you don't think about the food industry, uh, they have grades of food. You know, the vegetables are graded A, B, and C or th something like that. You know, the, and you got different grades of meats and whatever. You got different qualities of meats. Uh, you can't start out serving your customers the high end stuff. And then later, as you've got a clientele built up, begin to serve the cheap stuff. They're going to notice. And um, you can't disguise it. I mean, you can add more salt, you know. When, but when you change it, it's particularly when you change it by going from really good to bad, um, people are going to notice. And you'll, start, you'll lose customer base. Now, the, the hope is that they won't, you know, be, there's enough non-discerning people out there that they will continue and um, keep their their finances coming in, but it's noticed. And many times they do shut down. It just shuts them down. I mean, you just, they, they can't do it. <clears throat> and they can't undo uh, the change, as it were, many times because they just, they put a bad taste in people's mouth. <laughs> no pun intended. Hallelujah. Um, but in, in spiritual things, we can't start out with the power of God and then they begin to bring human reasonings and human concepts and, you know, human ideas in where it took the power of God to generate and create something. It's going to be sustained that way. Um, I've said this, and I heard this a number of years ago. I, I don't remember where I heard it, but uh, what minister I heard say it, but I, I picked up on it. Um, actually, it was, it was a minister named Tony Cook. Now, I'm not sure if he got it from somewhere else, but I heard him say it first. And they said, what you win them with is what you're going to have to keep them with. If you bring people into the kingdom um, with the, the power of, of, of the Holy Spirit and teaching you know, the word of God, you can't go back and later shut down the spirit of God and then water down the word. You'll lose those people. <clears throat> they were born in the fire. You, if you're born in the fire, you can't live in the smoke. Hallelujah. Um, when you look at the church of Acts, and we studied the Bible, we look through and read and, and um, begin to analyze things, you'll see that it emulated the Jesus of the Gospels. And the church of today must continue emulating that or carrying forth or manifesting or working in that same way and emulate the church of acts. Now I'm talking about when I say the church of acts, I know some of got going, going, well, we still are in the book of acts and we are, we're still in the church age, but I'm talking about the recorded biblical, uh, canon book of the, we refer to as the acts, um, which was so named uh, and so erroneous, the acts of the apostles, so it's the acts of the, uh, early church. The recording of the acts of the early church, not just the apostles. You got prophets, you got evangelists, you've got uh, all you know different people in here doing things, not just the apostles. Um, glory to God. It, it took supernatural to bring man to, into the earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It bring, it took, to bring Jesus into the earth to birth the church, and it's going to take it the supernatural to bring Jesus back again. God has always been a supernatural God. Jesus was the express image of his person. And he, according to the book of Hebrews, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Praise God. So in Genesis chapter 1, 
one can readily observe that the beginnings of mankind were far more than coincidental chance. And, you know, I'm telling you, some scientists have got more faith than any Christian ever walked the planet to believe that there was just a bunch of cosmic gas floating around out there that exploded, spun off, created the entire universe. And then in that, and after that, you know, there were orbiting or, you know, circling pockets of that gas that spun around and eventually formed planets. And then somehow or another on that planet, there was one spark of some type of energy that created one little microorganism uh, cell that has evolved into all the living things on the planet. Well, that takes faith. I'm going to tell you, to believe that, you got to have faith in, in something. I don't know what. You know, no, it wasn't by chance. This all didn't happen by chance. It didn't happen over billions and billions of years of evolution. That everything on the planet, I mean, think this. The gases formed, spun around, created the earth, you know, and became solid, had a solid uh, surface. And then the trees and the water and the mountains and the, the, the center core lava and all the different things. And then somewhere in there, I mean, animal life, biological life took place. Wow. It wasn't that. It was a design by a supernatural God and a supernatural creation. Everything. So people say, well, they've created life in a laboratory. Intelligence created life in a laboratory. You just don't have laboratories sitting around in the country somewhere and they ought just spontaneously create life. If they've created a spark of life, it took intelligent design to do it. <coughs> Can I get an amen? <coughs> Glory to God. So, um, man is of the design of the great master designer. Creation of the creator. Man was created to exist in God, the creator's sphere of existence. He endowed man with gifts. It was, um, it was regardless, it was regardless of the intellectual nonsense I just showed you, um, a divine supernatural beginning for mankind. And I'll be real honest with you. Man was not created with mugga mugga, ooga ooga, you know, walking around, couldn't talk, couldn't. The account we have from the word of God in Genesis, he communed with God, he talked with God, he named all the animals. Uh, he had authority. Him and the woman spoke. Are you here? They won't walk around like the movie 10 million, 10, 10 million BC or whatever that movie is, 10,000 years BC. I forgot the name of it. 10,000 BC or, you know, yeah, BC, you know, um, you know, and they are trying to create fire. They're hoping they can create the fire, you know, so now they can cook their food. Well, what makes them so smart? They want to cook their food. You know, um, we, we just, we, it's so silly, so silly. It is after the fall of man in Genesis chapter three, um, that we begin to see the deterioration of man. Yet God had a supernatural response to that fall. Um, and stated that there would be one so born supernaturally to redeem him. Throughout scripture, we have the testimony of the coming redeemer. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will bruise the seed of the serpent. Virgin birth prophesied. But it's always pointing to a supernatural thing. None pointed more, none more than uh, Isaiah 7.14 when the prophet foretold the supernatural virgin birth of um, the Messiah. Now, Look, at, look over there, if you will, into Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14. Isaiah 7 and 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now, Genesis 3.15 uh, foreshadows this, but this is just flat out clear. Okay? Uh, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which um, is translated God with us. God with us. Um, the false teaching of the Immaculate Conception is not recorded in Scripture. Uh, I, I just, she's not the Virgin Mary. 
Okay? Let's stop deitizing Mary. All right. The Immaculate Conception is the teaching that in order for Jesus to have been born uh, sinless as the Son of God, Mary had to also be sinless. Just not scriptural. Mary had to be born again, just like everybody else. She was not the Immaculate Conception. That is, that is a false doctrine in the church. Jesus was born supernaturally took on flesh. He pre-existed with the Father, and it was, it was a supernatural event where <coughs> the Holy Ghost came on her, and that thing born of her would be called the Son of God. Hallelujah. The, uh, any other teaching is just a lie, and it's a falsehood, and it's not true. And I know people bank their, you know, everything on that, but that's just a lie. She was not sinless. Remember at the cross, Jesus looked at her and said, and turned, pointed to John and said, woman, behold thy son, not him, John. And then uh, man, behold thy mother. In other words, she, she'll be your mother and you'll be her son. You know, um, not she's going to take off and be up there in heaven. You can pray to her and she'll get me to do stuff. Oh my, I'm telling you people just, you know, if you can't, if you can't keep people out of the church and then try to get them messed up with false church stuff. Jesus was born supernaturally. So we, you know, we have a supernatural creation, have the supernatural birth of the Redeemer, glory to God. Um, the Gospels, particularly Luke, uh, record the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of his birth, particularly with Jesus' birth and the, the accounting of his birth uh, and, and it being supernatural and of his ministry. The Gospels cover the supernatural aspect of the ministry of Jesus from the beginning to the end of his earthly ministry. Now, when Jesus ascended up on high, <coughs> he took a place of a new supernatural ministry as the apostle and high priest of our confession. Glory to God. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. He makes intercession for us, not Mary. Y'all here, you gone home. Who's out there? All right. And so we, we, we get through the Gospels. And, and the Bos Gospels are, a, tr are, are transitional books or recordings between covenants, between the old and the new. The ministry of Jesus being an Old Testament or an Old Covenant ministry reaching over and laying the foundation for the New Testament covenants or the new covenants in his New Testament ministry that would be carried forth by the church. Remember, he said, the works that I do shall ye do and greater than these shall you do. Praise the Lord. So we get through the Gospels and get into the book of Acts. And Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the, and the book of Acts. And we see in verse chapters 1 and 2 the birth of the church. That supernatural birth. Hallelujah. Where they, they were born again. And they received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And they became a powerful force for Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, it's a supernatural birth. Remember, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Th and then we look at Acts chapter 3. Glory to God. You know, I, I think it would bid, uh, bode us well, I believe this is the right word, to go back and read this and, and, and weigh the time, weigh what's going on and see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, how exciting it is to see something come in the earth that had not been there except in one instance since the fall of Adam. <clears throat> and that one incident was Jesus. Flesh, a spirit enclosed or 
Enclosure is not the right word. That's not a good word. A, um, a spirit tabernacled in flesh walking on the earth. From the fall of Adam until the birth of Jesus, that was not seen. David was not born again. Abraham was not born again. Well, you know, people say, well, Adam, if Abraham wasn't born again, ain't nobody. <coughs> Abraham's bosom was in Sheol, the upper regions, you know, Gaina, the lower region, hell, place of suffering. But Abraham's bosom, the place of comfort, with a gulf fixed between the two. And when um, Jesus died on the cross he, and was raised from the dead before he came up and picked up his body, he stopped off in Abraham's bosom and preached to the captive, captives in captivity and led them out. They got born again. They had to believe on him. Hallelujah. Praise God. But we look at Acts, Acts chapter 3 through 28, and we see consistently and ongoing over and over and over again a, a carrying forth of the ministry of Jesus happened because all of a sudden, after they're born again, the church begins, and they're baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. There's now not just one human spirit walking on the earth that's, a, that's the life of God. There's now something called the church that's alive unto God, born of the Spirit of God, and tabernacling in human in, in, Human flesh is men and women alive unto God in their spirits. Hallelujah. And they had the same image. Hallelujah. As the master himself. We are born of God. We are born again. The life of God is in us. Hallelujah. Can you imagine for, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 years from the fall of Adam to the birth of Christ, Satan walked as the God of this world, not having to encounter a human being on this. He, he, he had encounters with God, you know, uh, he had encounters with angels of God. He had, he had, but he did not have the human spirit who had been given the legal right to rule over this planet, gave it over to Satan at the, at the, um, at the, at the, um, it, it, when he, when Adam committed high treason and was born again from life unto death and became subordinate to Satan, Satan took control and captivity of the human race and became the God of this world. And all of a sudden, all of his strategies, all of his planning, all of the, the things that Satan had been um, doing had now fallen captive to a plan that was greater because from the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain. And on that day of Pentecost, that 120 stumbles out of that upper room, baptized in the Holy Ghost. They're born again, and they preach in the streets of Jerusalem. I believe on that day, uh, 3,000, and then within the week, another five. A, at the end of the first week of, of this, we have 8,120 born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for 6,000 years, there was nothing like that on the earth, and now thousands have been loosed. Glory to God. And it spread like wildfire. And then it even got to the point that in one place in the recording of the book of Acts, it says they that have turned the world upside down have come hither. Because everywhere they went, they went in the supernatural. They went in the power of God. They preached the word and their signs and wonders followed the word. <coughs> and whole cities were turned to God. Hallelujah. When you think about uh, Philip going down to Samaria and preaching Christ, they all gave heed with one accord, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he wrought. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Glory to God. The signs, the wonders, the miracles brought Pete, uh, uh, the whole place 
into the kingdom of God. And just as Jesus' birth and his ministry were supernatural, likewise, the churches must be. We've had a supernatural birth into the kingdom of God, the church. That's how we got here. We were born again. The life of God came. And we have a supernatural ministry. Hallelujah. And we are facing, we are facing things right now that we cannot and are unable to deal with in the natural. We cannot change. Folks, let me tell you something. We are not going to stop what's going on in the earth in the natural. I'm just letting you say law on that one for a minute. We need the supernatural church to rise up. Hallelujah. And we need to come together under the banner of the blood of Jesus and walk as that supernatural church and calls um, political leaders to shake in their boots at the site and say, not because we're walking out with military weapons and, you know, we're, we're coming in with, an, with ordinances and all this kind of stuff. No, but because we're a supernatural power that they cannot overcome and they cannot stop and they cannot suppress with anything they do. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So in the Gospels, let's look at the ministry of Jesus for a minute. <clears throat> and we're not going to read, I mean, obviously any one of these points I make, we could read numerous scriptures, okay? But, you know, Jesus healed the sick. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus went forth and saw a multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and healed their sick. In Matthew 25, 14, verses 25, 26, hallelujah, he overcame the forces of nature. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went with unto them walking on the sea and the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were troubled <laughs> i'm gonna tell you what's that mean it shook him up hello uh saying it is a spirit and they cried out for fear and of course jesus said don't be afraid it's me hallelujah according to mark chapter 16 hallelujah Verse 9, I guess that really is more further, further down through that. Uh, hallelujah. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. For Mark 16, 9. Now, when Jesus, he cast out devils. Now, when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She was a multi-devil person. Hello? She had seven devils. He cast all seven out. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't you listen. Some folks get uptight if they had half a devil manifest to them. She had seven. The legion had, uh, what was the Roman legion? 2,000? Two, they had 2,000, that guy. We are legion. Remember? The madman of the Gadarenes. If you come to cast us out before the time. And Jesus, who art thou? We know the name. He said, we are legion, for we are many. A legion, Roman legion was 2,000. They 2,000 got cast out. Hallelujah. And then in John, the 12th chapter, John chapter 12. Again, we could go back and read multiple scriptures along these lines from these points. Um, verse 1, then, the, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which, which Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he, that is Jesus, had raised from the dead. <coughs> so Jesus, in his ministry, healed the sick. He, cast, he raised the dead, cast out devils, overcame the forces of nature. Well, that was Jesus. Acts chapter 28. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 28. I kind of glanced down too quick and didn't... Uh, 
that my eyes focus quick enough. Acts 28 and 8. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in, prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. The sick, now listen, it's not just Paul. It goes on, uh, Peter and John. I mean, we got all through the book of Acts. In the, but in the book of Acts, the church. See, these men are part of the church. We have equated certain ones as no one can do those things. But Jesus said that these signs shall follow them that believe. Didn't say follow the apostles. He said we follow those that believed. Acts chapter 20. Well, these things that Jesus had only happened with Jesus to prove that he was the son of God. Well, Acts chapter 20, verse 9. And there sat in the window a certain young man named uh, Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. He's not so we, maybe the first person we have a record of that fell asleep in church. Now, we've had a few, few more since then. Nobody in this room or online has ever done that. And as Paul was long preaching, never had any long-winded preachers, have we? Hallelujah. He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul went down, fell on him, embracing him, and said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When therefore he was come up again and broken bread and eaten, talked, uh, and, and Paul talked a long while, even till the break, uh, the break of day, so he departed. <clears throat> and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. <laughs> I love the King James. And they were not a little comforted. I mean, they were overwhelmed with joy. <laughs> Got to use the King Jimmy flowery speech. And they were not a little comforted. But here, look at this. We've got healing in the book of Acts. And, and, and folks, it's not like two weeks after Jesus was raised from the dead. These are years. Years after Jesus ascended up on high. Paul, Paul didn't come into the church right away. It's a number of years before Paul um, was born again. And even after that, I believe 14 years before he was revealed to the church. He went off and studied. Hallelujah. So we're not talking like, you know, Jesus died and, you know, some of this stuff carried on for like the next couple of weeks. We're talking about decades, <coughs> decades later. Hallelujah. The, the miracles, signs, and wonders are going on. Um, Acts 16, 16. And when it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. Let's put it like this. She's demon possessed. Met us which brought her master as much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and crying, um, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Now, the people who used her to make money off of her weren't happy because they just lost all their, uh, their money because they just got the devil cast out of their soothsayer. So here we have Jesus healed the sick. Acts, they're healing the sick. Jesus raised the dead. <coughs> in Acts, they're raising the dead. <clears throat> and Jesus is casting out devils. In Acts, they're casting out devils. The church is carrying on the works of Jesus. Hallelujah. And then Acts 28, once again, some people like to say we're in Acts 29. That's, that's, that's cute because, that, that, I mean, it is, a really, it is an accurate description. We're the ongoing church. Verse 3, 
And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat, fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, and they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom even though he escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffered him not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. How be it? They looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they looked a great while and saw no harm came to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, so overcoming the force of nature, snake bites. Obviously, this was a very venomous snake that had obvious, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Consequences by being bit. Hallelujah. Where you knew in a certain amount of time they were dead. It kind of reminds me of that movie Father Goose with Cary Grant and um, Leslie Caron. And, um, you know, she gets against a stick in the water and the, one of the kids thinks it's a snake and they call on the, on the, uh, the, um, oh, the radio, whatever kind of radio it is. It's a shortwave, you know, and they get a doctor on there and he says the snakes in that part of the world are very, very venomous. She doesn't have much time. Begins to describe the symptoms she's going to uh, start having and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, of course, finds out later on it was just a stick. <clears throat> but, you know, they're waiting for her to, you know, start acting a certain way. And they're looking for all the signs. See, when you've experienced the seeing people die of certain, from snake bites and seeing more than once those things that happen, they're sitting there waiting for Paul, waiting for them to swell up, fall over, die. And he didn't. Right, because he overcame the forces of nature by the power of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So when I ask you a question, is the modern church, hello, acting like the church of Acts? Are we walking in that place? Now, I, I, you know, it, and I know there are pockets <clears throat> around the world. The American church has fallen prey to some things in the past uh, two or three decades. Um, there are pockets of things taking place in, in um, Africa, it's particularly Africa and South America, where God is moving and they're acting like the church of Acts. A lot of the American churches have gotten too, gotten too intellectual and the intellectuals have taken over and the, um, the naysayers have taken over and they, they, the academian where they come in and they've, you know, well, you know, well, the Bible was written and, uh, it really wasn't the word of God. It was, you know, um, it was, well, men, yeah. And they just start double talking their stupidity, you know, and um, some of us are so stupid you just can't deal with it. And there are obviously people who either just don't believe and then they, find, they try to find ways to disprove. If you start out with a narrative to disprove, you'll find ways to disprove something. That's why it's faith. Amen. It takes faith. There have been two periods in the church history um, Recent in, in, in the and I say in, in in the near recent history um, where we've seen the church act like the Church of Acts. It was Uzzah Street from about 1906 to 1910. Uh, the outpouring of Azusa Street, and then the 1947 to 1958 healing revival. I mean, you know, there were just there were things going on in that. I mean, buildings on fire. Um, you know, really that for, that first part, the first part of the twentieth century. Hallelujah. And then on the heels of that, the charismatic revival or renewal from the mid sixties to um, oh, I'm just going to say kind of around nineteen eighty ish. Not a you know specific timeline there, but. It was, it was kind of around that time. And um, we saw, so we saw a good 50, close to 60 years of really uh, that type of thing happening in the church. Um, Old Roberts had a tent that sat 20, 
thousand people. I think Jack Coe's had twenty two thousand. Um, you had people with tents that set thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And people would come. And there would be miracles, there's signs, wonders. Um, I mean, it turned the hearts of men and women. Hallelujah. Azusa Street changed a whole generation. Glory to God. And as we said before, you, you need to get the book. They told me their stories and read it. If you have never done it. Um, but since the Dark Ages, and what, what happened in the Dark Ages? Basically took the Bible away from the people. Locked it up. Did sermons in a language that the people it wasn't a common language. People couldn't have the couldn't have the word. Because they weren't smart enough to figure it out. And we call it the dark age because dark ages took place. And um, so we, there's been a hit and miss scenario. Um, since Rome institutionalized the church into an organization with hierarchy and the government of men and, um, you know, their creeds over the Bible and so forth. Called Martin Luther a heretic for preaching the just shall live by faith. Is that what the Bible says? Just what the Bible says. I don't care what the council of anything says. If it doesn't agree with the Bible, they, they can just go jump off the pier into a deep lake because it's wrong. We must regain the power and vision of, listen, the power and the vision of the early church doesn't mean we need to go back and act like immature like the early church. Okay. We ha there is growth. But in order to perpetuate the church and to bring Jesus back, there must be that reviving and renewing in the church of the supernatural power of God, of the church living in the supernatural. Hallelujah. If we continue to rely on methods and the means of men, we will surely fail. And it's only going to happen through praying in the Holy Ghost, separating ourselves unto the things of God and seeking his plans. It will not occur. It will not occur trying to be cute. Folks. This is what's wrong. You know, I mean, we have seen, and I, I know in the past 20, 25 years, it's been like, well, what's God doing? And when's God going to do something? And so we've been, and everybody's always coming up with something. And you always got some new church growth technique. It's going to bring, you know, build the church. And it's always some, some gig. It's always some plan. It's always some uh, technique. But they continually leave out the power of God. They, they they'll come up with a message that placates everybody. Oh, my. But let me tell you. When the power of God's in manifestation, God can pierce through the hearts of men in ways that a cool, slick message can't. Hello. We need a restoration of the power and manifestation of God. Now, listen, I'm not just talking about being excited during a worship service. You can have genuine spiritual excitement and um, connection in a worship service, or you can have hyped up flesh. And to many people, they can't tell the difference. They don't know. And, and honestly, and there, there's times when nobody can tell the difference on the spirit of God. The only way you can tell the difference is eventually look for the fruit of what's taking place.
Now, a few years ago, probably 20 now, but you know, at least 20, uh, there was there was things where people went around and every service, they laughed, every service, morning, noon, and night, and it was supposed to be some new move of God, you know. And I was in services, you know, and, and with ministries that it may have that in, in a meeting once or twice, but not every service, all day, the whole day. And I knew people that were there. They called me up and tell me, oh, you got to be in the, oh, couldn't even talk to me on the phone. They were laughing so hard. Now, this person had been like an Eeyore before. So during the time of the meetings, this lasted six weeks here in our town, as a particular church, they had them in for six weeks. They were laughing. They were going, to, they were going there every day, at morning, noon, and night, all three services, laughing, all calling me, you need to get over and get in these services. Now, I saw them just a few weeks after the meeting was over. Ehor had come back. Um, and, and, of course, my thinking is, was it spirit or was it flesh? Because if there was such, I mean, six weeks under the power of God like that, you shouldn't be able to function hardly any other way except carrying on that anointing. Um, <clears throat> but then all of a sudden, they're back back where they were. There has to be, I mean, there was such a move of God in the early church. These people were willing to give their lives for the gospel. There was such a radical change that took place in them. They were willing to give their lives for the gospel. Hello. Now somebody doesn't get their new car or doesn't get, you know, um, some new this or that. They fall out and say, well, I tried that. It didn't work. Yeah. So I encourage you. Begin to seek the Lord and, and, and call upon the Lord for reviving, restoring the supernatural in the church. And, and listen, and for the church to be hungry for it. You got to have a hunger in the church. You got to have a desire in the church. You got to have a, a, a want to in the church. Because God just don't knock you over and make you. That's not how it works. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> glad you could be with us tonight. We're glad to be back with you. I know it's been a number of weeks um, just because of our sabbatical, and uh, that was not that will not be a every year thing. Um, like I said, it's the first time in 40 years we've done that. So, um, so it's obviously with us not a normal thing. Uh, normally, I may miss um, two Sundays in a year, and a lot of times not even that, maybe one. Um, I've gone, I've gone times where I went years and I even missed a Sunday. And, um, and it's good to miss time and refresh and, you know, uh, step away and refresh. Okay. I get that. But, you know, I, I mean, uh, one of my mentors always said, you need to take a week off a quarter. And I wish there were times I wish I could, but just couldn't. And, uh, but so this was a good time for us and we're glad, but we're glad to be back and uh, blessed to have you with us and uh, look forward to be with you on Sunday. Don't, don't forget to join us on Sunday at, uh, one o'clock at New Life Family Church, where Faith of Victory Church is meeting on Sunday afternoons, graciously allowing us to use their facility. Also, I want to let you know that um, <clears throat> we're going to be starting a Bible study, and um, those of you out there, and we'll announce in the church on Sunday, you go ahead, want to go ahead and go on Amazon uh, or wherever and look for the book, The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon. The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon. It's also called his Basic Bible Course. Um, we're going to begin teaching from that um, very soon. Hallelujah. Um, could even be next week. <coughs> but we'll, with, you know, make sure you, you pick it up for, um, it's about 1348. I mean, if you go through, if you go through Whitaker House or Anchor Distributing, it's $25 a copy, but you can get it through Walmart. On, uh, or Amazon, I think for thirteen forty eight, a new copy, not a used one. You get used copies for six or seven dollars. Hallelujah! They're they're out there also. Um, but the Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E. W. Kenyon. The old one is is got real plain with blue with a kind of a half blue cover and writing on it. The newer one's more is a little fancier. Same book, okay? Uh, just re reprinted with a, a newer design or would have updated a little bit as far as design. Hallelujah. The Bible in light of our redemption, E.W. Kenyon, his basic Bible course. 
Praise the Lord. Well, until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online.